Hello, hello, John. Natalie, hello again. Hi. Very good to see you again. Good to see you. Good Isn't evening, it? good morning. <laughs> 9 9:30 p.m. here. Yeah. And uh, uh, well, much good. water has flowed under the bridge since we last met, yeah. as we chatted about before. And um, so, yes, I, uh, to introduce myself just um, briefly, I'm, I'm here in Sydney and I'm working uh, out of my office here at home and uh, people, people come and see me for a whole range of um, concerns and uh, particularly with the corona uh, hitting us all here so hard, people are starting to suffer a lot and they, they don't quite know what it's about. Uh, so people are coming to me on that basis too. I also do a lot of writing and uh, my essays, I think I've written about 21 books now mm. and uh, the essays are up on academia. So my life uh, in terms of uh, uh, enrichment of soul come, happens through engagement with people, which I love, and also with my writing. Mm. And I, when I talk about engaging people, I'm not talking about just professionally in the office. I'm talking about the way I engage people. Mm. Uh, if the conversation wants to stay on the surface, I, I just get bored and walk, walk out. And because uh, I'm, I'm just not, I just not interested, you know, it's uh, but if there's a soul spark somewhere, mm. um, I'll make a beeline for that. And if that means shuffling somebody off into a corner of a room and saying, <laughs> tell me more, <laughs> I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, ordinary social discourse, I, I don't have a lot of time for now. I mean, I'm 72 years old and I, mm -hmm. I want to get, I want to, I want to deal with what's stunningly absent in the world, and that is soul mm. and love. Mm. And, if, and if, I, if I'm in fields that... Stunningly are, absence in the world is soul and love. What a beautiful sentence. Yes, yes. 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 Soul is absent from people's considerations and love is absent. Oh. They, just, they just don't regard it. It's off the table. It's not for discussion. And a lot of my essays are about that. I call mm. it the death of soul, or the death of the psyche, or the death of the uh, uh, the death of the light. You know, all of that's getting to uh, our almost universal gesture of turning away from soul today. Mm. And there's a big price to pay for that. Mm. And they're turning up in my office. Yeah, yeah. Australia. I was, uh, I was reading, reading a book by a woman out of South Australia here, and she was quoting another woman uh, who said Australia is the place where uh, the culture gives absolutely no encouragement for soul work. Mm. None. Mm. And I, I happen to agree with that. <laughs> mm. You have to do it on yourself. You have to meet individuals here and there. Uh, some people turn to the Aboriginal community who is, uh, whose uh, elders are still filled with soul. But the, the, the culture, the, the, the overarching culture doesn't give a damn. It, it wants footy, cricket, mm. Yeah. Mm. entertainment. Mm. That's it. Mm. So people, people un under corona, where people are into forced isolation, I mean, how many movies can you watch during the day before you start going mad? Mm. You know, and this thing's dragged on for two years and, and people are asking serious questions, you know, is, is, is this entertainment, <laughs> is that all there is? <laughs> They've been stuffed with it. Mm. So anyway, that, that's a brief introduction and, and uh, uh, we'll get into our respective deeper works together where I see uh, a lot of overlap. Uh, I enjoyed reading your, your uh, installment too, and I went back and read your installment one and discovered passages that I'd forgotten, but I went, oh yes, I've got to include that somehow in our talk. Uh, and, and of course, your essays on academia. So I was just bringing myself up to date there. Um, but I do see an overlap. And as we talked about, I, I have, uh, I, thought, I thought a little scaffolding to our talk could be of mutual benefit. 
uh, and also the benefit of our listeners to just to see how uh, two people who do decide to take on a destiny, mm. what happens? How do they do it? Mm. Does that seem like a way to go here? Yeah. So can you can you um, can you ask a question? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Easily. As a as a way of introducing your book, Insolment Two, is a mature work. It's the culmination of a long path, and you've given hints of the various contours of that path in in your in your early book. Insolment One, which we need to explore a little bit, but uh, your book may be uh, at least a jewel or a crowning jewel of an unfoldment of a destiny, because everything in the book is so congruent and so uh, it's, it's like looking at a diamond. You still see the diamond no matter what aspect you go to. So that, that I think the way to think about that in 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 uh, literary form is that the, the book the book shows a dest shows the, the crown jewel of an unfolding destiny in mm. other words a path a path that reveals itself more and more to the practitioner as time goes on but mm. there's a time when you're completely in the dark as you know mm -hmm. so this unfoldment of a destiny people when people read your book they're going to get the, the full blown okay this is uh, this is natalie uh, at her peak, you know, or near her peak, or but it's a mature work, and wow, you know, people people will take away jewels on various levels from that. Uh, but it began somewhere. Hmm. It began when nobody knew who you were, where nobody knew who I was, uh, uh, and there was there was a beginning point. Now, in terms of where the destiny first showed its face or left a calling card. Right now, these these starting points or calling cards, there are many you can choose. I mean, I've I've chosen lots. You know, oh, this is this is where it began, and that, this is where. It, so, you, but that's like beads on a string. It doesn't matter what right. what start as long as as long as they have the the phenomenology of a starting point, then you you go you spring from there. And I, I've written quite a lot from various starting points that I that have been alive for me at the time. So I'll tell you one, and then maybe you could tell me one or two of your own as, as, as a way to introduce to the audience where it all began with, the, with that provide, proviso that I... Yes, I, I, I do want to say something. I, I do, something yes. comes to me when, you, when uh, we're looking at the journey, the destiny, where it began, uh, and the crown jewels. Um, I still feel like uh, I'm not. I'm not yet. This, these are not the crown jewels. These are jewels, like any creation, like any piece of art. Uh, but there's there's more. There's more to come. I don't even know what they are. And I also I can't quite tell you that there is that there is a beginning point, like you mentioned earlier about the beads. So. There is an ongoing unfolding of life. Um, of course, I can say, oh, in that point, I wake into this. In this point, I awake into yeah, my that's mind. What, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I found one in your first book, which I can okay. tell you. you like. <laughs> yes, sure. Probably in San Francisco. Yeah, go ahead. There's the elevator scene. Yeah. yeah. Would that be a starting point for you? You know... It is, it is, it is, the, the elevator scene is when I was still working as a, uh, in, in high tech in the Silicon Valley, managing large projects, IT projects. And then I was going up to a meeting and going to close a very large deal and kind of, you could be really proud of me, of me, my team, uh, but really, I couldn't care less, and I was 
feeling very soulless. I was feeling like mm, I, I couldn't care less. But I, I wouldn't say that that's a starting point. This is a, start, a starting point in the book. It's true. This is where I started the book uh, with my transition. Not the, yeah, yeah. yeah, not the starting point, but a starting point. At one particular bead that could be felt as a starting point to a whole lot of other stuff, just like yes. that. Yes, and, yeah. and this is what I'm trying to, to weave into here, that all of our lives all of the experiences we have, small and big, they're all, I, I talk about it, uh, experiences we're having. And these experiences, they're all remembering and knowing each other. Not only that these experiences remember and know each other in your own field, <clears throat> but they know and remember each other in the collective field and in the past, present and future field. So these are, Awake entities, these particles of experiences, they're awake. They're awake to themselves. They're awake to the environment they're in. They're awake to you as the vessel emitting them, the, the vessel, the body, the psyche, the, the, the soul emitting them. This is why when we talk about the elevator or we talk about other experiences, you could say, oh, wow, there, there's a big chunk of experience. If somebody had a surgery, or if somebody had cancer, or if somebody lost somebody really important, that's a, that, that's a big particle of experience over there, okay? It's, it's very charged, it's significant, it influences the landscape of the field of the soul, it really influences it, it's like a crater, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, but to tell, mm -hmm. but, but to, to say that this is uh, the starting point, for me, it's different, I see it differently, again, uh, because all of insolment and all of how I perceive life and perceive reality, it's based on perspectives. I respect all perspectives. So if you feel there is some influential and important starting points, then so it is. Particle um, of experience will just be fine. Great. I'm very happy. So, so the, ele the elevator would be a, 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 an example of a particle of experience for you. Yeah, it, it, it would be an experience that is significant. Yes. That the particles of experience that this experience is emitting and still is, that's the thing. It's still emitting its rippling effect from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. It's still emitting it. And like I mentioned, if there is a significant event, either emotional event, physical event, relational event, spiritual event, if there's a significant event, it tunnels through it very charged and very potent particles of experience compares to, okay, I'm just doing my work and I'm doing my writing and same old, same old. Mm -hmm. These are also emitting particles of experience. They're also very crucial to your purpose and your crown jewels and your destiny. They're as important or as, mm, uh, uh, but they have a different charge. They have a different color. They have a different influence. They have a different energy. So what makes saying, some significant? Yeah. yeah. What what makes some significant to you? And nice, beautiful. So this is an amazing question. What is what makes an experience significant? So it really yes. depends on, on your vessel. So I talk about the vessel, which is um, any stable arising, relatively stable arising, that's the vessel. Any stable arising, a thought, an idea, a cloud, a feeling. Um, the, the elevator scene, uh, when you were writing it, at least, seemed to be a significant experience. Yes. It, 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 uh, and it was very easy to read how it was significant. <laughs> the, <laughs> Namely, the reason it you, was significant, the reason it was significant, yeah. and you asked me a very good question, what is significant? In the vessel, I, I am a vessel. My, my entire bio field is a vessel. Bio, soul, psychic field is a vessel. In these vessels, there are some encounters with the flowing flow of the soul of the world, 
there are some encounters that significantly shift the perspective and shift the course of action. Uh -huh, and that have, was one of those. Yes, and they have higher, uh -huh. they, they have more charge. Like all of a sudden yes, you realize, uh, okay. like I'm, I'm just saying it because I, I see clients every day. So somebody comes and say, I realize I'm married right now, I'm married to the wrong person. It, I, that's a big realization to, to realize something mm -hmm. like this. Or I'm in the wrong job, or I'm in the, I'm not doing enough with my kids. Like these are big realizations that really shift the landscape because everything for me feels like a landscape. I'm so connected to nature. So the landscape of the unfolding of the soul changes. That's why I use the, the, the metaphor of a crater. It, the, the, there's a whole, all of a sudden, a whole movement in a whole nother direction. This is why it's significant. And for every person, every vessel, significance will be interpreted in a different way. Oh, yes, but the key is a significant change in direction that would have something to do with one's destiny. Is, yeah. Is it, yeah. Nice. You want, do you want to qualify that? Or did, is, was that That's right? Beautiful. Because, see, okay, okay. The, the word destiny also, I, I want to talk about it as well. Sure. Um, so the way I see it, this is a co-emerging, co-evolving, co creative universe the same way this conversation is we have a very generic outline to what we may want to dance with but what is arising the words from your mouth and my mouth they're completely emergent i mean yeah they could be predictable if you have a computer program to scan the possibilities of what we're going to talk about maybe you could have probabilities affiliated with the course of our conversation but it's emergent and destiny is emergent and is co-creative. So we have a direction, we have a more or less, you know, I'm gonna be living in Australia, I'm gonna marry this person, I'm gonna have two kids. So you no, know, th there's like generic outline to this destiny, but what's happening in every moment of unfolding is so, so unique and uh, many times unpredictable. Destiny as emergent is perfect. Yes. In, in other words, there are certain times in our life where something emerges into our life and produces the kind of change you're talking about that steers us in a certain direction that happens to be linked to other emergence yes. in the, in, before. So um, uh, perhaps your, ele your elevator really, well, it really struck me because uh, as, an, as, a, as something emerging that hadn't happened to you before, namely, uh, you uh, suddenly fell into meaninglessness, whereas everybody else seemed to be full of meaning, going to the projects, conferences, and all of that, and you suddenly had a moment where uh, the abyss opened. And that, that's very well known in, in uh, uh, mystical explorations, spiritual explorations. That, that moment is so powerful. Uh, and everything's brought into question. That's why I thought it was a mm. significant moment uh, to do with the un your unfolding destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, destiny is certainly not predictable. It's 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 like a, it's like peak, it peaks in and then disappears. And so, so I can have times in my life where I got it all, and then it collapses, and I'm back in the dark. Mm -hmm. So, in my in my case, there has been a consistent thread. Uh, a consistent number of beads that lie on this thread that that where where I've been struck by something emerging into my life that I was not prepared for, but which steered my life uh, in, in in a in new directions, all of which had to do with the destiny question. And um, I'll tell you a couple of them. They all have to do with with the snake, the serpent, and. Uh, I don't know how many little boys you know at primary school uh, who would doodle this way. I didn't doodle things you know, that other people might recognize. I doodled a serpent winding itself around a tree that had three branches uh, and resting its head on a branch. That's what I doodled. I had no idea. I was just enjoying it. It was a nice doodle. You know, no, nobody told me about snakes or you know and when people saw it they just go huh 
you know. But that doodle was an, was a, an emergence, a calling card, a letter from another dimension that had an impact on me in the sense that although I knew I had no consciousness of what I was doing, the memory stuck mm. and revisited me uh, decades later. Mm. So when, when I was 22, I was working I was at a farm uh, with some people and, and uh, a very long python had crawled into the chicken cage and swallowed a chicken. Mm. So we went down the next morning, there it was resting in the, in the chicken coop without thinking. I went right into the chicken coop, grabbed it around the neck, it wrapped itself around me and we walked outside. And uh, then they had a sugar bag ready and I slid it off my body and into the sugar, sugar uh, sack and we let it go. Now, where did that come from? Where did that gesture come from? Of um, I've never been afraid of snakes, never. Mm. And uh, so that was another bead on this string, mm. an encounter with the serpent. Mm -hmm. And uh, literally so, I mean, it's quite a big python. Uh, then, Amazing. when I, in 1979, when I left Australia, I came to the United States where I stayed for the next 20 years and I found a couple of teachers to help me along this path. Uh, but when I, as, soon, as soon as I landed in Los Angeles, my psyche exploded and uh, the, the first analyst I went to, all he could do was make sure the ship didn't sink. He didn't bother interpreting any of the dreams, the visions I was getting, they're just, they're just coming one after the other and he was helping me stay afloat. I, I didn't get any interpretation because he, he knew enough that this is, this is a torrent, you know, it's a tsunami and it's because to make sure this young man makes it. Mm. During that time, I had more, more serpent dreams than you can count. Mm. And uh, one in particular, uh, where I was in my analyst's office, the analyst of the, of the time, lying prone on the bed, on, on the couch, on a couch. <laughs> he didn't have one, but in this dream he did. And I was just lying there and then rising up from the side of the bed was this huge cobra mm. in the strike position. And he looked at me and I knew that I better keep very still. Mm. And he brought his big head close to my mouth and he flicked his tongue in and out of my mouth. And I felt this indescribable love, a mm -hmm. love that I had never, ever felt before. See, that's destiny. Tell me about what have you learned throughout the years about your relationship with the serpent and how yes, is it related to your soul? Uh, it's profoundly related um, in, the, in the sense that he is, that's the serpent power has been my guiding spirit mm -hmm. all along with everything. And uh, it's, um, a dream, a vision like that can't be interpreted. You have to live it. You have to learn to live it. So uh, what was I learning to live with? I was learning to live with this. I mean, in India, the serpent power is, 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 is great spiritual wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're not afraid of snakes either. Mm -hmm. And um, even though people die, they, they, if a cobra comes into a village, they'll give it a bowl of milk. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, so... Uh, Serpents or Naga, as they're called in India, don't have the fear aspect that we do in the West. Mm. Um, they're a treasure. They hold spiritual treasure. And so uh, what, what I was given in that vision was um, snakes are also um, a cold alien. Uh, you can't tame them. You can't be friendly with them. They'll do what they want. So, so there's a, that's where... That's where the, uh, the sense of a fate comes in, um, where you can't talk your way out of anything when you're faced with the serpent power. The serpent power is going to do what it does. 
And if you don't go along, it's going to be rough on you, but it will, it will complete what it wants to do. And so that, that's what I experienced in my life. That the, the serpent energy, which is uh, cold, alien, unreachable, but determinative, and also this indescribable love. Well, I was 30 years old at the time. I didn't know what to do with that, but I knew uh, that it was determinative. I knew that my life wouldn't be the same. And uh, from, that, from that time on, I've had many dreams concerning the poison of the serpent, the great healing power of the serpent. Um, and a, as I matured, and, and dream, the dreams that came to me sort of could, could work with the more mature me, if you like. It's, it's interesting how that happens. And, and uh, uh, so I began to make important links through my dreams between the serpent, love, and, and most importantly, time. Uh, the streaming. And uh, my most mature work on that it's, it's, uh, it is an essay I posted on Academia recently called um, uh, uh, Serpent Love and uh, in, colon, Embraced in Time. So I, I was able to finally connect the two, serpent or three, serpent, love and time, and be able to say it, to say, to say uh, what was coming to me. I, before I couldn't link those three at all. Yes. So I had to do a lot of work. And uh, so this, this is just an example of um, a destiny leaving a calling card and shaping your life from that point on. And every so often you get glimpses that tell you, yes, uh, we're still talking. Uh, you haven't been abandoned, um, even though I felt it many times, abandoned. But that has something to do with free will, but that's another question. But, the, uh, but every so often when I was uh, at my wit's end, I'd get another appearance that would say, uh, we're still talking, we're still... And without that, my life is not worth shit, to be frank, <laughs> without that connection. That's, that's, what that's you, where... What have you learned about the serpent, love and time? Um, I have to take you back to ancient Greek times for a minute, where a preeminent symbol um, uh, of the cosmos was that you have all of the humans and, and gods and demons in one topography, but a greater power binds them all. And that is the world circling ocean or the wor world circling river or the world circling serpent. They're different portrayals of the same spirit. That, that is a greater power than all of them combined. It's what, it's the power, it's, it, and it's, it's a streaming, it's a streaming, constant streaming. It both empties itself into itself and originates itself. It's completely self-fulfilling, self-containing, uh, no, no, no reference to anything outside itself. So it limits and binds uh, uh, all of us through its power. And the ancient Greeks had many symbols for it. Uh, many, we still have faint echoes of it today. So, for example, wedding ring, yoke, uh, tiara, um, wreath for the for the winner, um, uh, slavery. That's an interesting one, slavery. Um, and all of those. And yoga. Yoga is yoga has it has a word root linked linked to yoke. It invokes yoke, the yoke. And uh, all, all of those symbols, and there are many of them, um, point to an understanding by the Greeks that uh, whatever they do, they're bound by the streaming time. That's a difficult concept to get, but I'm just beginning the discussion. 
Uh, now, then as, time, as history goes forward, um, the circulating stream um, that bound everything disappeared. There was no more reference to it. So what happened to it? I mean, there's wisdom, there's myth. What happened to it? Well, one way to picture what happened to it is through the discovery of uh, Harvey's discovery of blood circulation, self-circulating blood. When, when he, that was a, an amazing discovery. So it's, the picture is that the world encircling serpent now turns up inside us as a self-circulating system, but it's empirical now, it's material. So that's a, that's a huge transformation. But what it, what it does briefly is puts us on the outside. So we're now, we're now free of the constraints of time. We're free of the constraints of necessity. We're free of being beholden to anything outside ourselves. We can do anything. In Christian terms, that's called delivered man. <laughs> We're not, we're not bound by this anymore. And so uh, we've almost, we've reached a, um, a kind of nadir of that in materialism where we're absolutely free to do whatever we want and we're getting into all sorts of trouble. We believe that if anything is gonna happen in this world, it's up to me. And, and that's, that's the point where in my understanding and writing about this, um, I'm writing about the return of the serpent which links to your work. Because one of, the, one of the, the language you use is all about streaming and flowing and becoming and arising and staying in the moment, which is ever changing. That's, that's the serpent. So that's where I felt an overlap in our work. Wow, fascinating. And it has to do with the nature of time. Einstein has done us a big disservice there. Because <laughs> hmm. he, he introduced and, and was favored for doing so. He introduced a time that's objective. Doesn't, you know, clock time doesn't depend on us. It just goes on by itself. So there's no co-arising. But your experience of time is co-arising. It can be two o'clock or three o'clock. But, 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 but yeah, but that's not what physicists talk about. Not that's not what the culture talks about. They talk about clock time. Mm -hmm. Lived time, which was what you're talking about. Lived time, which is not subjective. It's objective. Um, came to a cr crashing halt in a debate between Henri Bergson, who was a French philosopher, who was a proponent of duration, which is love, lived time, and Einstein with his clock time. Uh, there was a famous debate in France, and now Bergson was famous, far more famous than Einstein. He was famous all over the world as the, the French philosopher of time. And he got into a, he had a famous debate with Einstein where he lost. That was the end of it. That was the end of lived time. Collectively, I'm talking about. The whole world swung behind Einstein because they needed to standardize time because we're into global travel now and, and uh, international travel. And we had to have standards of time. You know, we had to know if I, like you and me, you and Israel, me here, how do we work out when to meet? Well, that was through the standardization of clock time. And live time couldn't compete with that. I mean, everyone was on board worldwide. The League of Nations was involved. Everyone was involved. They set up Greenwich Mean Time as the standard. And everyone was involved in, in standardizing the calendar. I, I know there are some differences, but basically having a standard Gregorian calendar and also standardized uh, time zones so everybody knew what how to connect with somebody else the, pro the problem of simultaneity and and uh, 
so he won and uh, the experience of time have, ha having experience and time paired together like ex how do we experience time just fell off the table disappeared collectively and that's uh, that's had tremendous consequences to our culture and and my my response to it all now is, is that live time actually wants to come back and it's colliding with clock time. <laughs> mm. And the, the disease of that collision is called stress. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a brief mm. look at what, what's that quantum leap I talked about after the operation. Yes. Wow. Fascinating. Mm. So, um, with your permission, I'm going to pause the recording just a second. Mm -hmm.